And via telephone, the delegate from the 94th District, Republican Larry Kump, who's been returned to the legislature. Larry, good morning to you, sir. How you doing? Good morning, and for sure and for certain, may God bless you all real good. I'm doing great. How is the bodacious Cheryl these days? Oh, bodacious Cheryl, the, the, uh, my beloved bodacious Cheryl is home listening and uh, anxious to come down here and join me. I, I am told when she signs receipts, it actually is it's signed bodacious Cheryl Kump. Is that true? That's absolutely true. 100 percent, baby. 100 <laughs> percent. Yeah. Larry, you serve on judici- uh, ju- if I can pronounce it, judiciary and pensions and retirement, which takes me to uh, pensions and retirement, because the state, uh, unlike many states, has done a great job being fiscally sound in terms of funding pensions and retirement. Is any of this surplus being used to accelerate some of those pension obligations? No. Uh, what they're, we're focusing on on that committee is to uh, decrease the unfunded liability even more. So uh, there's some tinkering around the edges here and there, but uh, more or less we're holding the same with pensions retirement, which breaks my heart because some of these pensions retirees, particularly in the area of cost of living, really have been hurting and something does need to be done. Is it correct that we haven't had an adjustment for those folks uh, while, while others have gotten raises, the folks who are on pension have not in many years? Uh, we have had to hit or miss some catch-up uh, uh, raises for retirees that have been in for a long time, but we took away the automatic cost of living some years ago, and that's what's really hurting people. Why did we do that? Was it when the state was hurting fiscally? Hurting fiscally. And now, one bill I've got in is a constitutional amendment, granted, uh, House Joint Resolution 14, which I hope would help retirees, particularly those that are homeowners. Um, we currently, in the Homestead Exemption Act, uh, in the Constitution, it says a maximum limit of, or actually a limit of $20,000 per home. And that was done in the, in the 1980s. Unfortunately, it's in the Constitution. So I have a constitutional amendment that would change that to say not less than $20,000, which would give the legislature and even the local counties the authority to increase that homestead exemption for retirees. Would that ultimately have to be voted on by the citizens of the state to become law? It would. It takes a two-thirds vote of the legislature, uh, and the, the bill is pending in the Finance Committee now, and I'm hopeful for hearing. And uh, that would have to be a two-thirds vote by the legislature. That would not go to the governor. Then it would go in the next election for a referendum uh, by the voters. On judiciary, you have a bill, HB 2849, to change the local uh, school board elections from the primary to the general. Why did you find that to be important? Well, that's always been an issue to me uh, because, quite frankly, uh, a lot of people don't vote on the school board elections because they think, well, it's primary election, and if they're not affiliated with one party or another, they say, well, it doesn't apply to me. Uh, if they're in the general election, uh, I think voter turnout and voter education on board of election issues would be in much greater. And uh, Larry, before Joe and uh, John have questions for you, finally, what did you think of the Senate's $600 million tax plan? And can you find common ground there to get something passed before the end of this session? I was actually excited about their announcement uh, yesterday. Uh, they rushed it through. Now, that bothers me. They, they have a tendency to suspend the Constitution and rush things through in one day, and that bothers me because I think we need really good scrutiny. That's why we have the Constitution. But uh, there are some good things in there, and the thing that excited me the most was they came out with a counterproposal, which means the negotiation now starts between the House and Senate leaders, and that makes me more confident we're going to have a final bill at the end run. And they had some good stuff in their bill. One of the things I liked, for instance, eliminated the marriage penalty in the in the tax laws, uh, which is something that needed to be done for, for quite a while. Now, I like the House bill, but uh, the other issue that I have with it is voters uh, in the last election turned down the amendments to change the Constitution with the car tax and uh, all that matter. And so I have some concerns about doing an end run on getting that uh, th- those, those license taxes back, uh, even though voters want it. It kind of flies in the face of what the voters did. Berkeley County approved that, but in the rest of the state, two to one, the voters went against that proposal. So I've, I've got a quandary with that, but uh, 
we'll see what happens. Uh, I don't want to do a Rube, Bo- Go- a Rube Goldberg type thing where we try to w- do an end run around something that the voters already said they didn't want. Joe. Larry, uh, Joe Ferretti, always good to talk with you. Uh, is, is it uh, your... yeah, by the way, my wife is, thinks you're hit the biggest hero ever. Oh, well, that's, that's kind wow, of her. What, what did he do? I, I, I don't know what delusion she's operating under, <laughs> <We'll take it. laughs> but, oh, but I'll take my, that compliment. My, well, my, my wife has a side issue with uh, vehicle defects yeah. in the car she bought, and Joe's been very helpful. Well, well, she, she's a, a real bulldog, and I give her a lot of credit. Uh, Larry, what's your what's your sense of things in the House with, with this uh, these various tax reform uh, approaches now? Uh, you saw, I guess, just at least preliminarily, what the Senate wants to do. Uh, Do you think you and your brethren really want to focus on personal income taxes in terms of cuts and reforms rather than this hybrid that the Senate is proposing? And and do you think that there's a workable solution at the end of all this? Bottom line, I think there's going to be a workable solution, which I if you'd asked me that two days ago, I would not be so certain. But I think uh, there's going to be a workable s- solution. The, the, I know the House leadership has been making regular visits to the Senate leadership. The discussions are ongoing. And I think at the, at the end, there's going to be a workable solution. I don't think that solution will be exactly the same as the House version or the Senate version, but I think reasonable minds can come together. And I, the big thing is, I think we need to send that tax dollars back to the voters. Amen. All right. So let me uh, t- take you back to the issue with the school board elections, because you know, we, we do discuss that a lot here in the studio, and uh, we understand the ramifications of, of, the, of who we elect on the school board. Uh, your, your bill is to move that from the primary to the general election, and I understand you, your your claim is more people are going to pay attention, and there's going to be more vetting of these candidates going forward. But the countervailing argument there, Larry, was to push that back that election to the primary was to try to get the politics out of school board elections. So why are we now putting more emphasis on uh, the vetting of these candidates versus? the concerns earlier of trying to get uh, away from the R&D after the names of these uh, Board of Education candidates? Well, number one, this does not change the nonpartisan nature of the elections. Uh, My bill does not change that. Now, there are some in our caucus that want to change that back to a partisan election, but my bill does not change the nonpartisan nature of the election. My bill just changes the date of the election from primary to general. Okay, that's a good clarification. Uh, but you lead, now your, your statement leads me to another question. Uh, why is there an effort to retrench on these nonpartisan elections that we do have? And I'm, I'm not talking uh, only about Board of Education, but also circuit court judges now. There's a movement afoot to, to make that partisan again. You know, sit, what, four or six years after we changed it earlier. Why is there an, uh, an impetus now to, to change change those elections and make them more partisan when the goal was to make them less partisan just six years ago well and i would agree with 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 that premise i don't agree with changing them back to partisan now i might be in a minority vote uh, voice within my party but uh, i agree with what george washington said in his farewell address that we got to avoid factionalism which means partisanism and uh so I don't. I don't think that's a that's a, that's a good move. Uh, I, I think the argument from our side is that well, we're a really red state. If we put an R by the name and a D by the name, we'll get more Republican candidates. But I don't think the issue should be should it be a Republican or a Democrat. The issue should be are they going to be a good school board member? Well, Larry, that's a good characterization of what's going on, and and I agree with your side of the argument. Let me just go on record with that. Jonathan Bodwell. We both agree, so everybody else should fall in line. I would hope so. (laughs) Larry, Jonathan Bodwell. I mean, I I, I think the movement may be afoot because in this world, people are partisan. I mean, there's just no, there are no two ways about it. We don't have a lot of, unfortunately, middle ground going on. And uh, there are legislators who want to, you know, people who, they want, they want people running for offices to state, you know, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I'm part of this, I'm part of that. Um, just to sort of, you know, as, as, as a litmus test almost. 
Do you think, um, and I, I agree with you, your bill to uh, move the school board elections to the general election, I, I don't know what the percentages are. One of these gentlemen here might, but a, a heck of a lot more people vote in the general election than vote in the primary. So we'd have a lot more of the electorate choosing um, a position that is, is as important as school board than we do by having it during the primary, I would think. I mean, is that is that one of the main the main points of your bill? That, that, that's that, that's the major point of the bill, um, and I, I think hopefully that also would bring some more education. Interestingly enough, some years ago, I don't remember exactly when we changed the uh, idea of pushing just one button when you go to the poll and just pushing I'm going to vote for all D's or all Republicans or all Libertarians, and uh, we changed that. And I remember the pushback I got from from some rank and file voters, they said, "Oh my golly, now I got to think about who I'm voting for." Before I just voted Republican or Democrat. Well, I think that's the point. We need to think more about what we're voting for and who we're voting for, uh, and that's why uh, I think it's a good idea, quite frankly, to have non nonpartisan election for judges, school boards, and perhaps some other people as well. Well, and you also then you get the people who are like, "Oh my gosh, I got to spend an extra three and a half minutes pulling levers." And oh, I have to, and I have to look the at the, heart. and I have yeah. to look at the names of the people I'm voting for. Does anybody pull a lever anymore? Does, no, are there any of those old anymore. voting machines? I remember, remember when we used to. Yeah, I remember too. Hold on, Joe. Just, just on the lottery machines. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, I'm going to go back to uh, retirements, pensions, and such, right? Because okay. somebody made a comment about it in our uh, Facebook community there today. We had CPA Ken Apple on not long ago addressing the different ways that states around us deal with retiree income. So Social Security benefits, Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania do not tax those in West Virginia it depends on what your income is as to whether your SSI gets and taxed. There's, there's a bill in this year to completely drop that other shoe to make West Virginia uh, residents completely exempt from state income tax. Awesome. That is great. Uh, pensions. Pennsylvania does not tax a pension. Virginia does. West Virginia does. For Maryland, it depends based on an inflation-adjusted exclusion in the state of Maryland. Some exceptions in West Virginia. For instance, we passed a bill a couple years ago to exempt uh, veterans' pensions from tax taxes. But my idea of, of the situation is, and this would not necessarily be a pensions and retirement committee, this would be a finance committee issue, uh, I think we ought to exempt all pensions. Uh, you've worked hard for it. You've been taxed when you were, were working to make that contribution to the pension. I absolutely believe that West Virginia should not tax pensions, period. I like the way you're thinking, Larry. Uh, right now, as you said, military, law enforcement, firefighters, and railroad workers are exempt from uh, tax on their pensions. Uh, distributions from retirement accounts. Pennsylvania, no. Virginia, Maryland, and West Virginia, yes, in terms of taxing your distributions from a retirement account. Your thoughts on that? I haven't really given that much, much thought, but... Uh I'd have to do a little more, more research on it, but I really don't think that that should be taxed either. If you if you have the need to distribute from your pension account, I re, it is really a, a pressing reason for it, and I don't think you should be taxed on it. Well, and, and that's, see, Larry, this is where you and I agree completely. Not, not that well, we you don't. Need to vote, you need to move to my district to vote <laughs> for me several times. I don't think you're in danger. Of, <laughs> well, that I can do. And he okay. means in the same election. If, if I'm going to break yeah. election voting laws, I can do that from a different state just as easily. You, you have, maybe you haven't heard about that. Uh, but my, my point on that is listen, uh, the federal government set up a Social Security system mathematically doomed to fail. Exactly. Unless they change it all the time by increasing taxes and increasing the income limit that you pay taxes on for Social Security. Then they and go and... We, and we, we, we have a problem with Social Security as far as its, its fund, fundability, but that's, that's, that's a big issue. Yeah. So they're basically making me save for retirement on my own, and then they're hindering my ability to live above a subsistence level by then taking taxes out of what they made me save because they set up a Social Security system that's doomed to go doomed bankrupt. To go bankrupt. Well, uh, that reminds me to a statement that Ronald Reagan supportedly said. He said the thing that voters dread the most is the statement, I'm here from the government and I'm here to help you. Larry, we're just about out of time. Final word is yours, sir. 
A uh, couple things that are, that are happening I'm excited about. Uh, among other things, in 2013 and 14, I had a bill, got a committee hearing. Uh, the committee didn't vote it out to uh, make all municipal elections the same as primary and general election dates. Uh, the Democrats were in, in charge then. They didn't like that idea. It didn't go anywhere. But now we got a bill moving out of the Political Subdivisions Committee, uh, which would mandate cities and towns to uh, have their elections on primary and general election dates, which would save a bundle of money and would increase voter awareness of what's going on in their local government. And, Larry, on that note, I've got to go. I appreciate your time today. Anytime. Thank you, Larry. Thanks, Larry. We'll catch up mm-hmm. again before the session ends and again afterward. Try to get through all of our members of the delegation here out of the Eastern Panhandle during this legislation.